And then on my right is Kathleen Stiles, and she is the first Chief Privacy Officer at the Department of Education, and where she coordinates and oversees federal technical assistance on privacy and confidentiality throughout the education community. And last but not least, at the end on the right is uh, Mark McCarthy, who's the Vice President of Public Policy at the Software and Information Industry Association. And he advises in the areas of intellectual property enforcement, technology and trade issues, information privacy, cybersecurity, cloud computing, and the promotion of education technology. And so now that you know who we are, um, we thought we'd just take a minute and ask a little bit about who's in the audience. So if you could just give us a little show of hands so we know uh, who's listening in and how we can best serve you. Um, so who here is just sort of an internet wonk type? Been here all day and didn't know where to go at the end. Or um, nobody. Privacy advocates? Educators? Hill staffers? Members? Industry reps? And what am I missing? Government? Other government employees? All right, a good, a mixed crowd. All right, well, on that note, I think we're going to start this. Um, sort of take kind of a speed dating approach and give everybody five minutes to give us their best pitch on why they're here, why we should choose their view, and why and why we're all here talking about student data. Um, and with that, um, I'm sorry. Thank you, and thanks so much for sticking with us, and there is a drink in your future after we're done. Um, so as Jenny just said, uh, the Data Quality Campaign is a national effort to really promote the use of effective, uh, the effective use of quality data to improve student achievement. Um, and I need to reiterate there, as an unabashed supporter of the use of data in education, that it's not about the collection of data that makes a difference, it's the effective use of that information. And I really think that's why we're now having this conversation, is that we're finally able to start using all this information that we've never had before in education. And, and with that comes a lot of really legitimate concerns and questions about how we're using it, how we're protecting it, and what we're doing with it. And I know we'll have a great hour-long conversation with that, but I wanted to start making sure that we got on the table why? Why does data um, have the potential to transform education? And why is it important that we really build that value proposition for why having access to great information matters? And then I know that we'll dive into talking about how, what we need to do to safeguard that and protect it. Um, but we really believe at the Data Quality Campaign um, that data can transform not just conversations, but actions, and most importantly, outcomes. Um, and you know, the dirty secret is in education, we've always had data, but it really hasn't been that high of quality, no one used it, everybody knew it was garbage in, garbage out, it was used for compliance purposes. And the real opportunity now, because states and districts have built these more robust longitudinal data systems, is that we have the ability to really change the culture in education, to not use data for compliance, box checking purposes, but to really use it for continuous improvement, to inform decision making at every level, um, and also to make sure that we are empowering people who have never had access to good information before. And that's the great equalizer. Data can be the incredibly great equalizer in education um, if we make sure that we get it out of people's hands. But one of the messages that we'll also, you'll hear us talk a lot about, is the fact that you can't promote and support effective data use without also making sure that you're safeguarding it. Because people will not use data that they believe will hurt them or that will hurt their kids. And so integral to the effective use of data is making sure that we're effectively safeguarding that data as well, and which is why this conversation is so important. The report that Joel put out is so incredibly timely and important because it raises the priority that we haven't done enough and we need to continue to do more and we will consistently have to do more as the technology continues to change and evolve with um, how we're using data in classrooms. Um, but let me just leave with a couple quick things about why this matters. Um, you know, our tagline at DQC is how do we change from using data as a hammer and use that as a flashlight? And we really do believe in this powerful, um, this powerful power, this powerful tool that data can be. And it not only, not only allows us to have these richer conversations, to provide this transparency of what's working in education, what's not working, um, how do we get that return on investment that we're looking for in an era of consistently tight resources. Um, but I think the really important part that I know we'll unpack more in here is how can educators use this information to truly personalize and tailor learning for every single child that we no longer lose kids along the way because we can't afford that in our economy. Um, but it also changes the whole dynamic of the role of parents 
and makes them true partners in their, in their child's education by giving them information that they've never had in context and tailored to their needs. And I think even mo more importantly than any of that, it also puts students in the driver's seat by giving them the information about their own academic progress and allows them to own that and allows them to also plan accordingly. So happy to talk more about the power of data um, and I know that we'll have a great conversation about what we need to do to safeguard and protect it, but really appreciate being here today and having you all in here for a uh, conversation. Great, well you referenced uh, Professor Reinberg's study, so since you put that out there, can we hear a little bit about it? Thanks, Joni. I'm, I'm delighted to be here this afternoon. I guess I should probably start by saying uh, I'm an unabashed supporter of the power of privacy. To, to do a riff uh, <laughs> off of what you were saying. Um, I'm going to answer the question. Um, can K-12 innovation and student privacy, can they coexist in the era of tablets, big data, and cloud storage? Um, the first count of the indictment today, my answer to that is no. The second count for the indictment tomorrow, um, the jury's out. And I think this really comes from the findings that we had uh, in our study that we released in December. We conducted a national uh, study looking at a representative sample, representative sample of schools from across the country to see how they dealt with children's privacy when they transferred student data to various forms of online service providers. And in our study, I think we, we've had the first um, kind of comprehensive look at the kinds of services that were being used across the country uh, by schools. Saw that they ranged from you know, things you would think about, data mining, data analytics, um, classroom functions is another category, uh, activities that were used within classrooms, guidance, data hosting, um, special services, or special school functions, things like uh, planning the busing routes, uh, managing payments in the cafeteria. And then our largest category uh, was we couldn't tell from the contracts. We couldn't tell what schools were doing. The contracts were so bad uh, that they didn't spell out what they were up to. Uh, we've had a whole series of, uh, I'll call them disturbing findings um, in, in our study. Uh, transparency was terrible. 75% uh, of districts were silent with respect to their cloud service uh, use uh, in terms of uh, working to other communities. 20% of districts had no data governance policies. So if a teacher wanted to sign up for Dropbox, which we heard from uh, this afternoon, uh, they can do so without informing anyone uh, in the central office, uh, which means there's no vetting of those agreements uh, for uh, privacy or any other uh, issues that, that school districts might be worried about. The substantive legal protections, um, it, it, we have a statutory framework in the United States. We have three statutes uh, that are relevant, um, the FERPA, uh, the Pupil Privacy Rights Amendment, uh, and COMPA. But one of the things we found in our study is that in many instances they don't apply to the activities that are taking place. Uh, and when they do apply, we found uh, lots of examples where uh, school districts weren't complying. Um, so FERPA covers educational records. But only what's defined as an educational record, it's you know, kind of like the transcript. Um, it doesn't cover uh, classroom function activity. It doesn't cover hosting services. It doesn't apply to vendors. It applies to institutions receiving directly federal funds for education. Um, likewise for the other, in COMPA, uh, if it's online work and it's taking place in school, COMPA, might apply and require parental consent. Schools might be able to consent on parents' behalf. Uh, if it's taking place at home, then COPPA can kick in. Um, the FTC has some guidance on it, but it's very fuzzy, um, which means it all turns on what the contracts say. And that's what we analyzed in quite detail. Uh, and we found uh, significant gaps. School districts relinquish control of their data. 50% uh, of hosting agreements do not prohibit the hosting service from redisclosing the data. 90% um, of hosting agreements, by the way, um, permit the host to keep the data after the contract is over. Uh, only a third require, excuse me, a third had no obligations for data security. There's no security on a third of the hosting agreements uh, with public schools. Um, very few contracts spelled out the purpose, why, what they were doing. Even fewer spelled out what data uh, they're, they're receiving. So when you look at the contracts, um, they're very problematic uh, 
the question then that we'll be discussing for the rest of the hour is, you know, what do we do? Uh, yeah, how do we draw some line? Do we draw some red lines in the sand about what we determine is permissible and not? Uh, that's Senator Markey's uh, proposal that, it, that he's been uh, speaking about. Or do we set, and how do we set, incentives for uh, vendors to draft contracts that are more equitable and more protective of student privacy uh, when school districts are asked to sign? I'll close there. All right, well, from that view, I, I would love to hear what the Chief Privacy Officer at the Department of Education has to say. So I was wondering if she was going to uh, industry next or uh, to us at uh, <laughs> your last part. Um, so good afternoon. You guys have stuck it out through the, the full day, but good. happy to see you here. Um, we live at interesting times in terms of student privacy. And student privacy is more important than ever, and yet we are faced with the opportunity to do so much with student data and um, with so many things that have changed since FERPA was first enacted 40 years ago. The internet didn't exist 40 years ago when um, FERPA was first enacted. Um, and the CLIP report, um, Joel's report that he was talking about, references a very clear possibility that student information could be misused. Um, the statutes that Ed administers, which are the Family Educational Rights Privacy Act, or FERPA, and the PPRA, the Protection of Pupil Rights Amendment, um, both of them are highly technical statutes. They apply more protections than I think people assume, but they do not cover the entire ground of the use of student information for um, non-educational purposes. Privacy is a, a key priority at Ed, and I think um, you know establishing a position like mine to start with is an indication of that. In the last several years, we have set up a Privacy Technical Assistance Center that provides TA technical assistance to schools and school districts around the country. And most importantly, we have started issuing a host of guidance documents. Um, some of the answers to um, how FERPA applies are not always that clear, <clears throat> nor have we been terribly clear about best practices. And we have issued probably at least 20 different guidance documents since I've been there on topics ranging from best practices for data security to um, authentication to some of the details of FERPA. Um, and we are in the process of working on guidance on the particular topic that we're talking here today, which is how school officials can um, contract for IT services and for web services, both best, both best practices and statutory compliance. <clears throat> it's a tricky issue to um, think about what is the best way in terms of best practices and statutory compliance because K-12 education in this country is so very diverse. We have somewhere in the neighborhood of 15,000 school districts in this country and they range in size from um, single school, school districts like some charter schools to large mega districts like, you know, here in the Washington area we have Montgomery, I'm sorry, Fairfax County. Uh, Montgomery County and other large school districts. And how school districts have approached these issues is very, very different. The challenge for us is not only to develop the appropriate guidance document, but also to get it out into the field and to get this information to the schools and school districts so that they can apply it. Um, and before I conclude, I want to say, just teeing up my friend Mark over here, that I, I don't think the responsibility is wholly ours. The responsibility for getting information out to schools and school districts is ours, but I think there is a role for industry as well. And Common Sense Media, Joni has said she's not going to be doing any advocacy here today, but I want to hype for her um, an event that they are uh, going to be hosting on February 24th which is a um, summit about an initiative that they have asking industry to essentially take a pledge on student privacy and particularly about marketing to students. Uh, my secretary, Secretary Arnie Duncan, will be speaking at that event and uh, it's one we look forward to. So with that, now that I've teed it up, or I'll, I'll let Joni tee him up. Well, that was a perfect segue into <laughs> yep, making my job very easy. So all right, let's hear um, <clears throat> from Mark McCarthy and sort of the view from the industry and the service provider Good. side. Thank you all. Um, and thank you for, for having, having me at this event. And congratulations to Tim Lorden, who's the organizer of, of this event every year for putting together a really good panel. Um, so um, what's my elevator speech, uh, since you've all given yours? Um, 
a, a couple of things. Uh, everything that Amy said and more, I mean, uh, data is extraordinarily important in today's environment where we're all looking for ways to improve student learning. Uh, we know in other areas that the um, advantages of big data analysis are enormously important to improve social life, bring economic benefits, uh, <laughs> empower people in various ways. Uh, and that same set of techniques can be brought to the educational environment, uh, and we're looking for, for ways to do that. In answer to the, to the question, can that be done and still preserve people's privacy, the answer is yes. Uh, and we're ready to stand with other people on this panel to try to work out ways in which we can assure that that will happen. Um, uh, in terms of do we need improvements in the current circumstances, I think we might. And we're looking for ways to explore what kind of improvements make sense. Uh, but I think before we get into a discussion of changes, it's important to keep in mind that there is a current framework for student privacy. It's been in place for many, many years. Uh, and there are themes associated with that framework which are worth understanding and emphasizing. Uh, the first theme is that student information should be used for educational purposes. The context of education is a well understood and well defined context. It's, it's like uh, medical context or uh, financial information context where people have strong intuitions about how information should be used and the purposes for which it should be, it should be collected and, and shared. Uh, and and the, the basic theme is it's there for the purpose of improving the education of the students. That's why you're collecting and sharing information. Uh, that's the first um, premise of the current framework that uh, exists at the national level. The second is that uh, there is the possibility for students' information to be shared with outside parties, with vendors who provide services to the schools. And when they do that, the current framework says they act as agents for the schools. They do not freelance with that data. Their perspective is to do what they are told by the schools and the school districts for which they work and for whom uh, they are essentially employees. They are there to do the kind of work that could be done by school officials themselves, but the school has chosen to outsource it. That's the theme, that's the structure, those are the kind of guidelines that already exist in the current framework. Now, there may be edges where that's not working right, and maybe new technology means we have to adjust some of the details of the way that framework works. Uh, and maybe one step forward is, as Joel and other people have suggested, uh, that we improve the kind of contracts that exist right now, a checklist <coughs> that would provide for uh, the vendors and for the school officials to know exactly what things could be kept in those kind of contracts. That might be an improvement. A set of best practices might be an improvement. Uh, and as Senator Ed Markey has suggested, maybe at some point we need to look at legislation that will update the, the statute that governs privacy at the national level. Uh, but let's start uh, this process in a collective spirit of, of trying to find the way in which we can do it all, where we can have privacy for students and for their parents and still take advantage of the, the new opportunities that are provided by data analytics and the collection of student information. So thanks, everybody, for setting the stage. And now let's just take a step back for a minute and, and sort of um, set the, look at sort of the, what's the state of play is on the ground. And what, what technology are we talking about when we're talking about tablets in the classroom and big data and the cloud? It, just in very real terms, I mean, I have kids in school. Um, what's out there that's causing this discussion? And why don't we start with Mark? I'm, I'm, I'm going to kick that over to my buddy Amy because she's she's been doing this for quite a bit, and I I, I don't rather have her take the lead on that one. Great. I, mean, I think it's a great question, Joni, because I think that's part of the reason why there's such concern out there is that people don't know what we're talking about when we talk about data. If you ask most people what they think about when they say, "Well, what's education data?" They're like, "Oh, a test score." We're talking about the test score. Um, and one of our roles at the DQC is to talk about data is so much more than a test score. It's the course taking patterns. Is, are, you know, we actually know what courses um, that kids take that are a great predictor if a kid's on track to being ready for going to college. And that's our goal is how do we make sure that every kid is prepared um, to have the option to go into, uh, into a college setting. And, and so looking at that, that's, it's course taking, it's information. And I think also the term big data is really scary to parents and to teachers and to people about what does that mean about kids. And I think 
breaking that down. So let me try to give you my sense of what those things are and invite everybody else to jump in. Um, you know, we have the data that is being collected every day in classrooms that happened before we had electronic stuff and digital stuff. I mean, teachers asking a kid, um, hey, thumbs up for comprehension at the end of a class, that's a data collection right there. How many kids are telling me by looking me in my eye that they've got it? Well, think about this now. We now have all these handhelds and digital learning and things going on that they're now machines that are doing that constantly. And when you start looking at that and then the teacher doesn't have to say, okay, 15 of the 20, she has instantaneous feedback on that. And what if overnight that that machine could then say, guess what, you know, two thirds of your class did not get that concept on fractions. So part of the concern is that there's incredible powers when you talk about using that and then being able to then, when you're able to link the data of that immediate feedback of what's happening to teachers in the classroom, that that information doesn't have to go anywhere. That can stay right with a teacher in a classroom. Nobody has to see that. It never has to be identified other than to the teacher who needs to know that, probably to the student to figure out that feedback and to a parent. But then this is where we start having these conversations about who needs to see what access to what. So as you start talking about them, well, what does a principal need to see? Does a principal need to know that, um, that you know, Jane Gadara didn't get the fraction lesson last night? Or does he need to know that, wow, two-thirds <clears throat> of the girls in, in Mrs. Smith's class didn't get this, so we may have an issue with how do we educate, um, how do we help give some professional development to Mrs. Smith about working with math with her students? But it's this whole idea then that we also then have the power of this big data when you then aggregate all that incredible information that's being collected at a, at a school level, at, at a classroom level, you then have the power of real big data that we can then look across the system when this information is de-identified you know, de and say, what's working? What curriculum is actually getting us the results we want? What did that cost for that to do that? And also the power of predictive analysis of being able to say that we know that kids who took this course can go there. That sounds scary if you're a parent thinking that Jane Gadara's information is being thrown up into a cloud and everybody has access to it, but that's not what we're talking about. And that's really important in this conversation that we help parents and citizens in general understand that every that we have to de-identify that information and that really there are very limited people who need to know um, anything about that kid um, on an individual level. So that's I don't know that where we wanted to go, but I think that's part of this. We're going to be working. We have some great infographics on our data quality campaign website right now that start to capture what I just described in terms of how having just-in-time access to quality data um, transforms the teaching and learning process in a classroom, how it changed conversations between principals and, and teachers, how it changes that conversation between students and teachers and parents. Um, and we're going to be doing a lot more to help explain this broader view of who needs access to what data, what's identifiable, what's um, disaggregated, and the power of having that information at different places. But the bottom line is, not everybody needs all that information, and it's limited amounts of information as we go up. Could, could I perhaps jump in, too, and talk a little bit about some of the technologies? Because, mm -hmm. um, I mean, piggybacking, I think what Amy was talking about, uh, really largely the data analytics program. So these are things like uh, platforms for data sets that are then analyzed to determine which instructional model might be best for a child. So one that's been quite controversial that you may have read about is InBloom. You know, that's that type of model. That's only one piece of what we're seeing. Um, other things that some of you may have seen, for example, portals. School districts will use portals to provide information to parents on their kids' grades, to provide access for the children to uh, see their homework assignments or to submit homework to teachers. And the technology behind that, it's on the web. It may be something that is hosted locally with the school district, le leasing, leasing software from someplace else. Um, or it may be, as it is increasingly, licensed out. They'll, they'll contract with a service provider. All of that mm -hmm. uh, uh, data will be maintained on the service provider's host. And in that instance, it's the school district's information about its children are going to the third-party provider to then offer the portal services uh, to the kids and the families. Um, there are other kinds of you know, learning tools. Um, some of these may be uh, directly online, um, reading modules, assessment quizzes. You know, health class has a little thing, you know, are you eating vegetables today? Um, here's why you should eat vegetables. And that's going to be an online tool designed for the kid. Or it may be the, a mobile app, you know, it's today's SAT question, the SAT question of the day, that sort of thing. Um, we find other um, kinds of services, um, say th th some of these special functions, um, payment cards. So the student ID becomes a payment card for the, for the school cafeteria. 
Um, schools will outsource uh, to online service providers planning busing routes. That came up with some frequency in our research. Um, email services. Right? School districts have email for their teachers, staff, and sometimes for students. Uh, those are going to be typically outsourced. So they may outsource their whole IT department. Um, the guidance department has a variety of tools. Some of these will be designed to track children. Some of them will be designed to um, enable the children to follow along themselves, to uh, research on uh, different colleges, usually associated with college planning um, process. So um, what we're seeing in each of these technologies are multiple players in the chain with the school district, ranging from it may be the tech developer, it may be the host, it may be the service provider, it may be the state. In some instances, the state is actually the contracting party making services available to the local schools. Um, it may be something that's a community-based um, project. And then we're seeing them also, some of them are pay with cash, others are pay with personal information, they're a freemium model. So there, there's a tremendous heterogeneity on the kinds of services that are out there. I think that was one of the things that really surprised me uh, in our findings, was just how diverse uh, the kinds of services were and the providers of those services to school districts across the country. Can I jump in on something, Joel? When you think about your own life, I mean, what Joel just said was amazing. When you think about all the ways that having data has changed the education process, not just the learning process, but how education's run and managed and all that. But think about your own life and compare how you use data today compared to 10 years ago. I mean, just think about how you made a dinner reservation, think about how you shopped for a car, completely different. And I think education is like every other part of our life, although I would argue it's even more imperative that we use information because we have not been getting the results that we need as a country. And that you know, we believe deeply that only when we start tapping into the power of data are we going to be able to really um, get those results we need. But it's a, that list is it's incredible. But also think about in your own life how that's changed as well. Can, can I jump in here having abandoned the, uh, the field earlier? Uh, I, I like the idea that there are a lot of different technologies out there and I think the list is, is important to keep track of. Um, but I think it's, it's also important to, to simplify it so we can see the kinds of things that the new technology can do. And one area where I think we see a lot of different technologies at work but the result is the same is the area of personalized learning. You, you want to develop a mechanism through a lot of different various techniques to make sure that the educational material that is presented to the student and with which the student engages is designed for that student's unique capacity, skills, and abilities. That's what you want out of an educational experience. The use of information is crucial to that. You cannot do that kind of personalized learning without knowing a lot about the individual students. So that's one very important use. A second one is a little bit different. It's not the kind of you know, school official use that we normally think about. It's an assessment of, of, of where there might be some problems. And it's here that uh, uh, after you know, looking around and trying to find the best possible analytics provider, a school district might say, uh, can you come in here and look at this um, a set of individuals who are dropping out uh, over a period of time and give us some analysis that could help us anticipate when this might be happening so we can intervene. You know, a, a dropout rate of what we've got in the upper 40s is not a good one. We'd like to improve that. Uh, and it turns out that there are analytical techniques that can be used to <coughs> provide some advanced indications of when students are at risk and when intervention is appropriate. Now, th this, this is not the kind of tool that can be used indiscriminately, and it, there's a serious danger, perhaps, of stigma being used in, in that kind of context. But it's the kind of thing that can provide real information to, to school districts and to teachers and to school administrators that can help students succeed more and more often than they are doing right now. So those are two big areas where I think we've got to focus on the advantages of, of this kind of new technology and the the capacity of these new technologies to respond to the current educational challenges that we've got. Okay, so we've heard a lot about the technology, we've heard a lot about the benefits. I'd like to turn to Kathleen for a minute and sort of ask you, what keeps you up at night? What are, what are some of the risks, <laughs> the questions you're getting, areas where FERPA may not be or PPRA as clear as you would like? So um, two things I want to mention when you ask me what keeps, us, keeps me up at night, and I'm, I'm going to try to give a quick answer because I think we want to 
get some audience questions and leave some time for that. Um, two things. Um, the two statutes that we administer, FERPA and PPRA, are both enormously complex statutes. And when you're trying to get out a message about privacy to school officials and about what they're supposed to do to comply with our statutes, it doesn't help that they're so complex. And, you know, we've got FERPA that applies to education records, and exactly what's an education record you would think would be simple. It's not. Um, the PPRA applies to individually identifiable information collected from students. You'd think that would be simple. It's not. So the, the very complexity of the statutes troubles me because um, the, the strongest privacy message is a very simple one. <clears throat> and in the, the specifics of what we're here talking about today, the, um, the specific that troubles me the most are um, consumer applications being used by schools and districts. So when schools have, um, you know, the, author the, the bargaining power to go in and negotiate with companies, you know, I think there's a better chance that both they and the company they're acquiring services from understand what each other is doing. But a lot of, um, there are instances in which, you know, at different points along the school um, continuum, um, teachers or administrators or whomever are accepting consumer apps, which may not provide privacy protections which are consistent with our statute or perhaps best practices. So the, the consumer <coughs> apps bother me and the complexity of the statutes. My quick answer. Great. And so, um, and then I'll, I'll give everybody a chance to respond. So do you think we need more legislation? <laughs> We are open to talking about that at the mm -hmm. Department of Education. <laughs> Senator Markey has made some interesting proposals, and we look forward to talking about them. Mark? So um, if, if the question is, um, what do we, do we need legislation? I think my answer is, I, if there is going to be legislation, we want to be part of the process. If there are limitations in the current framework, people find the complexity of the statute too much, or the you know, the, the, the mechanisms for making sure that when consumer applications get into schools are not quite adequate. If there are going to be adjustments in those areas, we want to be part of that process. Joel? I think it's going to, I think we will find it is necessary to have new legislation. Uh, given that the basic statutes are, were, were created at a time uh, before the internet, uh, FERPA, um, and how we see it applying today or not applying uh, in these situations, um, I think it's necessary. You mentioned um, schools having bargaining power. Well, one of the things, uh, I, I went into our, our research sort of expecting I was going to be um, uh, most concerned about what schools were doing because the responsibility under FERPA falls on the school. I came away with a very different impression, which is that schools are not in a position to deal with these problems. We looked at schools, I mean, we had a school in our data set that had under 500 students in it. We had schools in our data set with hundreds of thousands of students uh, in it. And across the board, I think one of the things we saw was that schools essentially have no bargaining capacity. Um, they're just, they don't have the expertise, uh, either on the privacy side uh, or the technology side, let alone both together. When they do, the vendors are not giving them, uh, these aren't negotiated contracts. Uh, in fact, I had one a school district, a major city school district in the United States, with legal counsel, agreed to a contract that violated the state's uh, open public records law. It was a contract that prohibited the disclosure of a public contract. Um, and this is with legal counsel. They had no way to change the term uh, of the contract. So that's <coughs> not going to be resolved. Um, I think by leaving it to self-regulation. We found in, in the contracts, um, you know, it's not the edges, it, it's the core center. Uh, we couldn't, I couldn't point you to a single contract that uh, we thought was, I'll call it, close to perfect, you know, that really covered the base as well. Um, that's distressing. You think about some of the examples, I, I agree with Mark completely, you know, and, and with Amy, this is about personalized learning. Um, but how do we go about doing it? I mean, what are we talking about here? We saw instances, you, to, to do that personalized learning, the model is we create a large data set of massing information, not just to say one school, but multiple schools. Um, and some of the information in that data set, social security numbers, depending on where you are. Some states, for example, include birth weight of a teenage mother's baby in that data set. 
Um, why? Because they try to piggyback social services to the school uh, function. Um, you know, you'll see all sorts of things. My, one of my favorites is um, uh, one place in our country um, includes whether a child curses in class, uh, which of course is going to have uh, every you know adolescent in the school uh, in, in the database for some form of discipline. Um, so y you've got all of this data. Well, what's going to happen with it? I saw one model where the data set, what was being offered was a vendor was going to come in, have access to all this data, mine the data to then report back to the teacher in a particular <coughs> classroom that they ought to use you know, for reading or math. Long division was a problem for the classroom. Let's assume that's the, the issue. So here are modules for long division. Well, think about what that means. The educational data is being put into uh, this data set for mining by a commercial vendor. It's done on a name identifiable basis. These, are, these kids can be identified. And it's being done so that that vendor can sell its commercial product to a teacher in a classroom or to the school district. Um, I think that raises issues other than just uh, individualized instruction. You know, it's what's the role of commercialization in, in the school systems? And then how do you deal with an instance, say, we can identify states in the United States, Texas, for example, um, that had big issues over the content of textbooks associated with political issues. And so if we're doing individualized instruction and we're not thinking about how we frame it and structure legally that type of data mining, we're going to be embroiled in the kinds of problems that cause the good uses to be prohibited, that won't happen. I mean, we look at InBloom. InBloom had nine states were starting with InBloom, and there are only two left standing. One is in litigation at the moment because of the privacy uh, issues. So I think I probably... So, right, probably, I was going to say, yeah. so Amy, yeah, be free to answer. <laughs> legislation, no legislation, and if there are other... Yep, so policy. I'll pick up right where some of the issues that Joel brought up. I mean, for all those issues, um, it's really important that especially states legislate, and we're seeing right now across this country, 15 states have already um, have in, con in conversation in this current legislative session um, a conversation, a very public conversation, which is why we believe so strongly this needs to be a legislative action, is that in our legislative branch of, of, of government, that's where the public gets a voice. And what this conversation needs is for it to be broadened and for us to educate one another, to listen to one another, to listen to the legitimate concerns, to uh, maybe rectify some of the misinformation that's out there and let people know what is legal already and what we already have laws for, and maybe in cases where we need to be better um, at strengthening some of it to keep up with the changing technology needs. That, you know, a law that was uh, written before the internet probably needs a little updating to make it clearer and to help Kathleen sleep better at night to provide some clarity. Um, but that's what we're seeing is that State houses, across state houses right now in this country, we're having that conversation. People are having that discussion because in, you know, when you look at it, people know there's some really inappropriate uses of data. So you know, FERPA is the floor in terms of doing that. And you know, I don't want to weigh in that short. There's probably a need for some more federal legislation. But where I really want to put the attention on and what's happening right now is the need to have this conversation happen at the state level and for states to have this discussion with their citizens um, and with policymakers and to create um, policies and practices and governance structures and expectations around their citizens of what they can expect in terms of what data is being collected, do, is it transparent, how is it being safeguarded, how is it being governed, and, and how it's being protected, and how are we going to update this constantly? Because we're never going to be done protecting data, and that's the bottom line. It's not a project. It's not a one-time thing. It's not something we're going to do this year and then put it on a shelf. This is a conversation we need to continuously have with our policymakers and with our citizens, and we need to talk about how data literacy incorporates an understanding understanding of the ethical and moral uses of data as well. All right. So we've, we've talked a little bit about education records, <coughs> how the data is used for schools. What about um, outside the school? Are there any parties that are using student data for commercial purposes? What about marketing to kids and families? Kathleen, do you have any reaction, information? Well, I think the, the clip, reports point, clip report points out the possibility of that. Um, and that is a concern, um, and that is uh, gets to the heart of the, the changes that Senator Markey has been um, or has proposed. Um, and um, you know, it's interesting because neither of the statutes we administer, PPRA or FERPA, prohibits marketing to students. What they regulate, what they deal with, is the use of student information for marketing, for your behavioral, your targeted types of uh, marketing. Um, and there's also some important scope issues in there. So just to 
point that one out. I think that's a, a key question. So, so if, if I could just jump in quickly, um, the, the, uh, the, the framework, as I understand it, for, uh, under FERPA, is that the information will be used for educational purposes. Um, and to the extent that student information is used for purposes beyond that, uh, it's in violation of the letter, perhaps not the letter or the spirit of the, of the current statutes. So I, I would draw the line there. Um, if the information is being used for educational purposes, then I think it's sort of within fair play. If it's gone outside of that, then I think we have to look at, at, at some questions um, in, in that area. And the example that Joel used uh, before of a, a company that's mining student information and then make, making recommendations for educational material, that strikes me as being well within the educational context. Uh, because you're not making recommendations for purchasing other products or services. They're all educational. And uh, it seems to me that a publisher who has that kind of information and finds after analysis that a particular product would actually be to the advantage of the student, that, that publisher has an obligation to tell the, the school that, to say this is something that can actually help your students. Uh, and so I would put that well within the educational class. And then what's the industry response to all this discussion? Do you see your members sort of getting together and thinking about rules of the road? Is there some consensus on um, where the line is or where you cross the line in practices? We, um, we have internally uh, discussed with our members and um, with other people on, on the panel and in other context uh, the importance of best practices so that we can have some sort of guide to the, to the industry about what the, the way to go in this area would be. Uh, we, we don't think it's appropriate for the industry to develop the entire universe of best practices or a checklist for contracts or anything. Um, school districts have to be involved in that. Other parties have to be involved in it. Um, educators need to be directly in, in involved in that kind of discussion. But we are actively looking at what we can do in the area of best practices and, and what we can do for a checklist for contracts that would, would provide some sort of guide rails for the industry. Uh, and then engage in further discussions with other people in the community to see if we can extend that so that all parts of the community work together to make sure that we're doing the best we can to protect student privacy. All right, so, go ahead. <laughs> I, I was going to take, a, a, just <clears throat> say something about using the data for advertising educational products to, to students and their families. Um, I don't think that's appropriate. Uh, the data in this instance is generated because of compelled circumstances. Kids are in schools. The data is generated um, through the schools. The schools are stewards of that information about the children. Uh, and I don't think it's appropriate to then commercialize that and use that uh, for commercial purposes. All right, look, one more thing and then we'll open up to the audience for a question. So we've talked a lot about schools, government, policy makers, industry. What about parents? <laughs> and what's the <laughs> giggle? What's the role of parents here? Do they have the right to be informed? Should they be able to consent to use of the information for anything or to the use of information for everything? So let me start on that one. And I know Joel has views on that as well. And um, you know, many of us are parents ourselves. <clears throat> um, so FERPA has various notification requirements, that there be an annual notice at the beginning of the year um, and those sorts of things. Beyond that, we have very much strongly urged at the Department of Education that schools need to be uh, more transparent with parents. Schools, districts, and states. And uh, I think the, the best avenue for that is frankly the websites. And you know, we feel that websites for the districts and the state <coughs> education associations should indicate what information they've got about students, why they're collected it, how they're using it, and how they're protecting it. That's basic information. Parents should have that information. There's no statute that says that need to, needs to be made public, but it's important. And more than that, I think it encourages the conversation that you want parents to be having with schools and the kind of involvement that you want. So very often in, in my world, um, when we get complaints, we run a complaint operation um, in my, my office for FERPA, um, the complaints that we get in aren't really about privacy. 
and parents will call and they'll complain and they will be very upset and it is a failure of communication a lot of times between the school and the parents so I, I don't think you can do enough in terms of transparency um, between the schools about the data that they have and how they use it so anyone else mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I, I certainly agree um, wholeheartedly with uh, Kathleen's comment about transparency. But there's another issue that we we found in our research, which is um, the consent problem, and I'll call it forced consent. Uh, think of all the times when you, uh, in your consumer lives, have to go through a click wrap to, to get someplace, and you're agreeing to terms of service. Well, the same thing is happening with parents when they're agreeing to, say, the access to the portal for their <coughs> child. If their child is going to gain access to be able to see the homework, the parent has to activate an account. That to do that, they have to hit a click wrap that has all sorts of terms and conditions on privacy that essentially the parent has no choice. Right? The choice is either let your kid have his education or refuse, or refuse to agree. Um, so I think the, there have to be some very clear ground rules for what the scope what the scope of that consent is, or as I said, I think earlier, we need to draw some red lines. And then other than the red line, then fine, we can, as long as parents are informed, they know what they're doing, they have an ability to see it easily, which is presently not the case, um, then there's a role for it. Uh, but you can't put parents in the position of having to consent to things that uh, w that they would not want to do with their kids' information. And they're stuck because the alternative is their kid doesn't get an education. Yeah. L let me jump in there quick because I, uh, that, that's one area where, where I agree. Um, it, it, we, we can't put the entire weight of control in this area on parents' consent. You, you can't say anything goes if parents consent. Um, for a lot of different reasons, one is the kind of forced consent you just described. Um, the other is the, the possibility that, that in, in making a decision in that area, they, parents would inadvertently deprive their children of the best possible use of resources for their own education. So they may not be in the best position to make these kind of judgments. Uh, so for, for all those reasons, I think the idea that there need to be ground rules for how these uh, materials, these technologies, these websites, these applications, how they're used in schools, there have to be some ground rules associated with that and there should be a process whereby if some of these consumer applications are going to find their way into the school context, uh, there has to be some sort of process mechanism vetting by the school itself that puts some guardrails there to make sure it's done right. I'll just add that I agree with everything that my colleagues just said, and in fact, one of the things that we're seeing happening in the state legislation that has been um, dropped right now in the current sessions is this focus on mandating that every year state agencies publish a list of the data being collected on kids uh, and doing that. And I think that that has the, the opportunity to get rid of a lot of the boogeyman thing, to let people know what's out there, and we'll start conversations. I also just want to guide folks to a piece that we did with the um, Parent Teacher Association PTA that's on our website that is a guide for parents about what you should know about data and what you sh and the conversations and questions you should be having with your school because we believe passionately that parents are the most critical part of their kids um, learning process and they need and for the first time they're going to be empowered with great information but they also need to be empowered with knowing that they can trust that this information is going to be used to help their kids and not hurt their kids so please take a look at that it's on our website all right um, with that why don't we open it up and see if there are any questions from mm -hmm. folks second row I'll have one question um, one stakeholder that seems to be missing from the table are the schools yep. themselves. And I think they have an important role to play. I don't hear much about governance. Mm -hmm. Where, and this is going to be hard. It's like the early days of the web when you had a lot of companies that didn't have a clue and they did <coughs> stupid things and then the FCC came in. But somebody needs to help educate the schools about what they need to do to be responsible because they have good intentions and they want to provide a good Absolutely. And so it's not just the parents, but and then they can also yep. avoid making stupid decisions, maybe not about a port, but about downloading apps and this kind of thing, where it's just, they don't know. So I think, and I don't, you all can't do it, but I mean, I think this is one of these, it takes a village, lots of the <laughs> PAs, the, yep. Yep. the industry is just, here are some ways yep. it works in other settings, so 
Amen. So let me answer that first and just say I agree with you so much. And you know, the, again, one of the challenges here is there's so much diversity in the way we administer education across this country. Um, you know, all 50 states are different, and you know, in, in many states, you know, even district by district, it's very, very different in terms of how um, data is administered and what's collected by the district versus the state versus the school and where the the information's kept in the state. You know, in some states, IT services are centralized in the school system and they're farmed out um, down below that to the districts and the individual schools, whereas in other states, you know, really individual schools are buying IT services, which, you know, I, I gotta think there's a better way. But anyway, um, so it, given the diversity, it's, it's hard to reach out. And, you know, we try to do technical assistance and get down to the school level and, you know, even reaching districts is tough, let alone reaching the school level. So there's a real communication challenge there. But there's the same problem in the private sector because of everything from a Fortune 10 company yep, to mm -hmm. app developers in their garage. And so it's the same issue exactly. and it just takes a lot of work and outreach. And there are principles that can be scaled either up or down. Yeah. And, 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 and yeah. I said the ad department can't do it all. Right. You make a great point on the that they need to get the schools and the school districts and the state education departments involved in the conversation. Um, w one issue is that a lot of good information can be made available, but on the receiving end, there's sometimes a lack of expertise in understanding what to do with that. And so one thing that could be helpful, and some of the states have a proposal along these lines that might be workable, is to make sure that each school and school district has available to it a, ch a privacy officer who can help them with these kind of discussions. Uh, I don't think every school needs one. I don't think every school district needs one, but uh, maybe at the state level, the state education department should have available to it the services of someone who's dedicated to these privacy issues and can serve as a resource for the people in that state to look carefully at how the information regarding their students is being used. And real fast, we know there's some great um, work being done right now of creating toolkits for school administrators. Uh, those should be coming out in the next couple of months. We also know that there needs to be those kind of guidelines for vendors of all sizes. So everyone's hearing it absolutely. Mm -hmm. And DQC is sponsoring an event with 24 other organizations on February 4th on putting out a definition of data literacy. And as I mentioned earlier, part of that definition is going to be how do you, how, being data literate as an educator means that you also understand what it means to protect data and to safeguard data. So one of the recommendations we're making that we'll be putting out is that we need to change licensure and certification processes and rules for teachers, that they understand not just only how to access data, but they understand their role in protecting it. And then we start talking about how do you train the current workforce to also get that. So there's lots of very tangible things that we can do to get there, because this is a culture change. You know, This is about how do we catch up our professional development, our awareness, as individuals, as systems, as sectors, to keep up with these changing demands. And we all have to change. And it can't be one sector. It can't be one individual. It has to be all of us doing this, a village. We, in our rec so go ahead. I think we have another question, too, and I just want to oh, make sure. Two seconds. In our recommendations, one of the things uh, that we pushed quite strongly was that the states have a chief privacy officer function in the State Department of Education. Because as educational policy is now data-driven, the states need to have it and there needs to be a mechanism to help the districts understand uh, throughout the states uh, what these issues are. Okay. Go ahead. Hi. I'm uh, Cheryl Nyanza and I do a lot of work oh, uh, from the civil rights perspective. Um, and so I, I have to say, I was listening to this conversation and I, so I've done a lot of media justice work and uh, communications rights, broadband inclusion, not a lot of privacy, um, but I just, I find myself just <laughs> oh no! <laughs> oh no! But really, I mean, on the one hand, I can see these amazing benefits. I personally am a second grader, and it drives me crazy when, like, she's taking these tests and her teacher doesn't even know how she's doing or how to implement them in the classroom. And then the other hand, having come from such a long background of working about, you know, equity issues and broadband inclusion, and here we are. There could be, and, and plus, I'm thinking about the communities who are like suddenly going to realize there's going to be a list of African American kids who might drop out. And the superintendent has it. Or there could be, you know, or whatever it could be. And it just, I mean, I understand that everybody's trying to say there's a way to make this protected and make this safe. But I think that people's minds immediately go, and I immediately just get very anxious about even the families in my own school because they're not online. Like an internet disclosure on a website is going to help them not at all. They don't even get the PTA list service. So 
I'm just wondering, you know, and, and broadband including, I mean, 10 million people in this country don't have broadband, so they can't go online and use the web portal and make an informed, you know, decision about their mm -hmm. data. So I'm just wondering if people have thought, you know, if these principles or these places where you're moving towards, are they talking about race? Are they talking about income? Are they talking about equity issues? I mean, presumably they are, but I'm just wondering if you could kind of expand on that a little bit more. And I mean, I just see communities, you know, like I said, I mean, I'm, for myself, I'm just like, you know, all the tracking, uh, you know, all the tracking issues and conversations we've had in education where our kids get tracked, all the questions that we've had, you know, the Department of Education got a great report about how important race was in terms of punishing children. What about if there's an error in somebody's data and all of a sudden a kid is tagged as, you know, whatever? So anyway, there's so yep. many things, and I know we can't yep. cover them all in the next few minutes, but <laughs> So, it's an excellent. So, actually, I'd love to just uh, get your information. I'll send you a piece we just put out on early warning systems because what you're talking because this power of predictive analysis sounds so scary. And again, the boogeyman that we're going to start making lists of kids that we should give up on because they're going to fail. And that's not at all what we're talking about. What we're talking about is we can now figure out which kids are falling off track and that we don't have to wait till they don't show up for graduation. It's so that we can actually help them. And the issue is how do you? How do we help parents understand that data is the great equalizer? You know, and the story I give is, you know, before there was data and this equal access to data and everybody we had were able to disaggregate data, the little dirty secret was if you were a mom or dad who could afford to go to the community pool in the summertime, you knew exactly which teachers not to let your kids have. Well, if you're a mom or dad and you're working three or four jobs, guess what? You're out of that information loop. And what we're talking about now is how do we equalize the access to information. And we need to deal with the fact that not everybody is sitting there walking around with mobile access. But I think there was some great information that Berkman came out about, uh, Berkman Center um, up at Harvard came up with who actually has access to mobile and it's interesting to see. But that piece is really important about how do we make sure that everybody has access to or communicating not just digitally but also with paper. But, but this whole focus on being scared is a legitimate concern about are we gonna use the data to keep, to track kids, to keep them from opportunities that could help. It couldn't be further from the truth in terms of the conversations. And again, I'll go back to legislation. This is this conversation that it's not just that the teacher or principal has a list. When you're putting this together, it, for the first time, we're going to have this equal access to information to say, what the heck's going on that all these kids aren't where they need to be? And the system's going to look at it. Parents are going to look at it. We're going to have this equal access to information. And it's going to be for good. It's not for the tracking to keep people out of doing things. And I have to tell you that the civil rights community and the work that we're doing, are so in favor of using data because to them this is data is the great equalizer. It's the access to information is what makes decisions. Is it? Yeah. Right. No, no. Right. But come see me. I'll give you. A, I'll right. It's almost five o'clock. So Mark McCarthy, final word. Um, I, 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 I can't help but respond to, to your, your comments because I, I think, Cheryl, you're, you're onto something that really is at the heart of many, many people's nervousness about these new techniques. Uh, and, and to be honest, I think there hasn't been enough conversation about these questions of justice and discrimination and fairness and equal treatment, uh, and I think we should have more of it. It's not just a technical question where you find an algorithm that makes things work and no one really knows what's going on and then sort of implicitly you wind up doing a kind of racial profiling. You, you gotta watch out for that. You gotta be careful about it. Uh, it can be done and it, it is being done properly at this point, but I think you're right to be worried about it. And I think the industry and the educators themselves have to step forward and be explicit and clear that the, this is dealing with an area that is very important for parents, and parents have to be informed fully about what's going on and why it's going on. Kathleen? So my one-minute version that I want to sum up and give to you is please don't go away, what was it? It was anxious, quivering with anxiety. Please don't do that. The, the takeaway I'd like you to take away is that there are great opportunities for this increased use of data um, in schools and in school districts, but we've got work to do. Joel? Um, I'm actually going to agree with something Mark said earlier. Wow, that's a great <laughs> way to it relates, it. it relates directly to this point. Um, uh, Mark at one point said that, uh, you know, there may be areas where we don't want to give the parents the choice uh, about what they do. And I think this is a really good example. You don't, for example, want all of the rich suburban districts opting their kids' information out because then you can't figure out um, what's going to work and what's not going to work for other 
populations, other kids that are having trouble in school. Um, and, and I think that's really important. But then where it leads me on the equal justice um, point uh, is really what I want to close on, that if privacy is going to be well protected, then the use of the data will be fair and it's going to be equitable for all kids and all families. And I think today we have to do a far better job protecting the privacy of the data than we're currently doing. And then Amy? Last, last word? Last word? Oh. <laughs> I, just, I was going to say, I think what you'll find is that there's more that we all agree on here. And I think if we were to talk to you about that, one, the power of data is huge, but that data um, is useless unless people believe that it's going to help them and that they believe it's going to be kept safe and secure. And I think that that's what each one of us, no matter where we have, where we're coming at it, is working towards and that this has to be a conversation that we're all actively part of. And I think, you know, last year, the, the word of the year was privacy for 2013. <coughs> I'd like to say no way. It's the, it's the word for the decade, if not the century. And that is what we need to deal with, is that this is a conversation that we each need to be an active participant in and listen to each other and learn from each other and work together. Because our kids can't afford not to not to have us do this. So. Great. Well, with that, um, I think we can all agree on that. <laughs> None of us want anybody here to leave being anxious. So first, <laughs> let me um, thank our panelists for taking the time to um, chat today and thank our fabulous audience for listening so attentively. <laughs> <laughs>